Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the second spring lecture of the year. We started a very good last week with uh, uh, Simon Bourdieu's chart, who helped us navigate through the chaos theory, um, which is a big part in the theme of this year, which is the human view on reality. We like to see how people have been explaining their observations. And this week we will talk about dark matter and dark energy, which is actually a, a very interesting theory within trying to explain our observation, as it is not we observe something and then we create a theory around it. We actually created theories and we just needed one more element for these theories to work. And this element is what we call dark matter and dark energy. Um, this is the first time in history that we are going to try to solve this mystery uh, on what dark energy and dark matter is, and that is with the Euclid mission. Um, and who better to talk about Euclid than Gordon uh, Bertrand-Sellera? Uh, she is an integral part on the Euclid mission in ASAP. She works in North Bank with a great team, and I just heard during lunch that this is the first cosmo cosmology mission that uh, has more than a thousand people working on it, which is very incredible. Um, Guadalupe uh, studied, is from Spain, she studied physics in Spain and then got her uh, PhD in uh, cosmology here in Bay. And I am very, very excited for this talk and I think you will all very much enjoy it. So please give a warm welcome to Guadalupe. today to hear about a really big part of my life at the moment, which is this cute uh, satellite called Euclid, and um, what better to introduce you to this amazing mission with a short video that we prepared at ESA, that we would like to, to basically inspire what this mission is about. So let's hear. In 1915, Albert Einstein astonished the world with his general theory of relativity. It described the behavior of the entire universe based on the matter and energy contained within it. The theory sparked the modern discipline of cosmology and the hope that we would finally understand how the universe came to be. But in recent times, the effort to define what the universe is made of has given us a very big surprise. Visible stars and galaxies make up less than 5% of the universe's total matter and energy. Beneath this visible layer is a mysterious celestial realm, consisting of shadowy particles and unknown energy fields. For decades, astronomers have puzzled at their nature, calling these elusive substances dark matter and dark energy. ESA's Euclid mission will go in search of an answer to the fundamental question what is the universe made of? A European designed mission, Euclid is built and operated by ESA with contributions from the International Euclid Consortium and NASA. ESA selected Talos Lumia Space to lead on building Euclid, with Airbus Defence in Space providing the telescope and payload module. The telescope and scientific instruments form the heart of the mission. Together, they will observe billions of galaxies over more than one-third of the sky. Producing record quantities of data, Euclid will enable scientists to draw a precise map of the universe across space and time. This will allow researchers to investigate the effects of dark matter and dark energy on the apparent shape of galaxies and on their motion and distribution over immense distances. In turn, this will help reveal the true nature of dark matter and dark energy. The spacecraft and data communications will be controlled through ESA's European Space Operations Centre in Darmstadt. To cope with the vast amounts of data and will acquire, ESA's S-Track network of deep space antennas has been upgraded. These data will be analysed by the Euclid Consortium, a group of more than 2,000 scientists from more than 300 institutes across Europe, the US 
and the Antipan. Understanding the elusive nature of the universe has drawn astronomers throughout history. It remains one of the most challenging investigations in modern science, but Euclid is up to the task. The Euclid mission is a quest into the unknown, a mission to shine a light on the dark side of the universe. And let's start by the biggest embarrassment that we had in cosmology, which is the fact that modern cosmology has evolved for the last 20, 25 years, and we are able to produce amazing cosmological results. And with amazing, I mean with really precise statistical certainty. However, what it has left us is that most of the universe that we believe that is out there is composed by 95% of true components that we don't know what they are. So we are able to say that it is 95% of the universe that it is unknown to us, but we know nothing about these two main components. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, this is not okay. <laughs> so I think that this is the main motivation for the ESA Euclid mission and for all the cosmological missions out there. This is one of the biggest problems that we have right now in cosmology, and this is what we are trying to solve. So from this 95% of the universe, 25% of it is what we denominated dark matter. So it's some type of matter, so it interacts through gravity in the way that normal matter is, this 5% of ordinary matter that everything is made of. However, it doesn't interact with light. So we can only see its effects through the indirect um, interaction with gravity. We also know that our universe is expanding. We know that since the 20s, from last century, However, what we discover at the end of the last century is that our universe is expanding in an accelerated way. And this is really puzzling. We have two options, which is saying, as the video was starting with, the theory of general relativity of Albert Einstein is incorrect. And I don't feel comfortable with this because we are in this space here, in Leiden Observatory, old observatory, and Einstein has spent a lot of time visiting this beautiful city. But it might be that actually the theory is incomplete. Or another option is there is some kind of an unknown substance that, because we are not really original in cosmology, we decided to call it dark because we don't know what it is. And we know that it has to be some kind of energy because it's driving this acceleration to go faster and faster. And this is dark energy. 70% of the content of our universe, which is a lot. <coughs> that basically leaves us to explain what is this accelerated expansion of the universe coming from? what is the nature of this 25% of the matter that we cannot see. Despite of the fact that we know that 25, sorry, 95% <laughs> of our universe is unknown, we still can say, well, let's assume that the model that we have in cosmology, that because we are not really original, we also call it the standard cosmological model, because it's the one that it works, that is basically based on the fact that we have 70% of black energy, 25% of black matter, and we assume that basically our universe behaved in a really natural way since the moment of its creation through the Big Bang. We can actually assume what is the universe that like, so what it happened since the moment of the creation, some Big Bang, that actually we don't know anything about, how the first uh, nuclei, the first nuclei of atoms were created, how basically the rest of the structure started to form, stars, galaxies, gravity played its role, up to the beautiful universe that we can see these days in the forms of galaxies, clusters of galaxies forming the structures out there. There is a connection, of course, between what it happened, or we believe that it happened in the very early universe, and later of what we are seeing today. Because we see a structure right now in the universe with your eye, with your naked eye, you can go into a beautiful, not here in the Netherlands, nor in the north of Spain where I'm from, not cloudy night. You can actually go out there with your naked eye, you will be able to see galaxies, even though you most likely will identify them with stars. But the reality is that galaxies tend to cluster and they try to tend to form this filament TV structure that we call the Dutch scale structure of our universe. We can trace it back 
to have this shape here, knowing that general relativity holds, let's see how the distribution was at the beginning. And the lambda CDM model, which is a standard cosmological model, basically tell us that there was some kind of mechanism in the very early universe that we call inflation, uh, that basically means that the universe underwent an amorphous expansion in a very short period of time, raised the origin of the density perturbation that evolved later to form the structure that we see today. But we also have another puzzling, which is the fact that this expansion of the universe since a few million years ago is starting to accelerate. This is something that we would like to explain, and this is basically the origin of Euclid. This is what Euclid is going to try to see. So Euclid is going to basically study what is the evolution, what is the structure of these galaxies from a period in which we know that dark energy started to dominate. So basically when our universe started undergoing this accelerated expansion. So it's definitely a challenging task. But as the video said, we are up for the task. The first step was basically building the spacecraft and launching it, because we are operating from the universe, we are operating from space. And the launch took place after many years of delay. We finally had Yuki flying out there in space. This was the first time, well, actually the second time, but the first for a serious scientific mission that ESA was co-working with SpaceX to launch a spacecraft. So we launched on the first last 1st of July from Cape Canaveral in Florida <coughs> with the Falcon 9 through SpaceX and it was a success. I was still really relaxed that morning. Everybody was like, why are you so feeling so relaxed? We are launching today. And I was like, we never launch on the thing that it is planned. <laughs> so that morning I was like super relaxed. I'm not going to get like super illusionated because at the end of the day it's going to be a disappointment. We are not launching and we did. And everything went so fast, so smooth, that at the end of the day we were still like, is this real? Like, is Euclid really flying out there? But when this one was actually going, three, two, one. Power to operate the spacecraft, 
Whereas at the same time, it will look towards the darkness, okay? So we will be able to see and take pictures of the deep parts of the universe. We are not alone operating from the Lagrangian point too. We have other bodies, best friends in space. Who is there with you, Pete? So basically, James Webb and Gaia. And a question that I get really often, uh, mostly because of the terminology that we use to be calling like a Lagrangian point, is that, do you have enough space to operate like all the spacecrafts? <laughs> Definitely, okay, it's a really big area, a really, yeah, a really expensive neighborhood to be operating from, but definitely it's a really big area. So you can actually see here the orbits of the different ESA spacecrafts that are operating from this Lagrangian point. You see that UPIN has a really similar trajectory and James Webb, and even though that you see that they are crossing, they are not actually crossing. Whereas Gaia is a more intermediate point uh, between the other two, the other two telescopes. It's going along with the Earth, so as we move along the year, you can discover it with us. This is also interesting in terms of communications. But let's see, what is actually Euclid meant to do? Well, Euclid is a telescope, as you've seen, like a pretty rudimentary telescope. Um, so it's meant to take pictures, it's meant to observe uh, the space. So the ultimate goal of Euclid, as I said, is to study the largest scale structure of the universe, which means, in our words, we want to do basically the Google Maps of the largest scale structure of our universe. So we want to map the structure out there. So you can put the pictures, and then from these pictures we will be able to classify them along the time so that we can create this fantastic 3D map of our universe. This is the goal, and it seems easy. I bring slide with a lot of challenges, because actually how many pictures we have to take so that we can actually classify the galaxies along the time, because you know, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. That means that galaxies are farther from us, we see them to be older. So if we actually classify the galaxies according to the distance, we are classifying according to time. So basically the third dimension of this 3D map, time. How many pictures we have to take so that we can construct this map? <coughs> Many, 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 many pictures. But what it matters is the number of galaxies. How many galaxies? Billions of galaxies. And you said, okay, billion. A billion, like in a word, it sounds short and small. But a billion is actually one zero and then, sorry, one one and then nine zeros. So it's like a lot of galaxies to classify and study. And how does it translate to? That you need to take pictures of at least 33% of the sky, okay? So if you project the night sky in a sphere, we are aiming to take pictures of all the gray areas here. You see that actually there are some orange parts. This is where Euclid is gonna stare a little bit more time uh, to see deeper what's going on. Uh, we are gonna use these uh, deep fields. Uh, this is how we call it in astronomy language. So deep, deep observations for calibration, but also for science. And in terms of cosmology, to understand these dark ingredients of our universe, we want to take yeah, pictures of 33% of the sky. And you might ask, you're already being ambitious enough, right? I mean, you're putting a spacecraft in space. Like, why don't you go beyond that? Why don't you take like 50% of the sky or like 70% of the sky? Because unfortunately, we are contaminated from our own Milky Way. So Euclid is operating from the Lagrangian uh, point two, which means that, yeah, we are pretty much in the plane of our own Milky Way. So yeah, this contamination, we still see the stars of our own Milky Way. So there isn't anything that we can do in that regard, but we are mapping everything else. So I consider that that is ambitious enough. <coughs> By the way, is there any questions So while I'm talking? I'm happy to take them, so just raise your hand. Yeah. There's this sinusoidal uh, ribbon that is excluded. I was wondering what is that. So you say that the, the uh, um, galactic plane is, is excluded, I understand. And then there's this funny branch at the left, and then yeah, it the seems one. there's a correspondence on the right as well going on. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, so this is also coming from the fact that uh, the uh, statistics that we are going to do will come in, um, I, I can explain it later, but this is coming from 
the kind of observations, per process of observations that we're gonna use to compare to the cosmological models. And what this means is that this part here is also contaminated by something that we call dipoles. So on top of that, um, we want to do science, which means that science has to be reproducibility, and we need to compare also with observations that we have taken from other observatories, also from air. So this is the maximum area that we overlap with other competitors and other surveys. Excuse me, I, I thought you measure speed and direction as well of the stars. I will go into that, but we are not interested. Sorry. No, it's fine, don't worry. Uh, in Euclid, we are interested in galaxies. Why galaxies? Because we are aiming to go beyond our neighborhood. So basically, most of the stars, 90% of the stars that we see, are coming from our own Milky Way. If we stay in our own Milky Way, we cannot say anything about the largest scale structure of the universe, which is what we need to infer to actually say something about the stark ingredients uh, of our universe. That means that we need to study galaxies, which are farther away from us. And this is also as well why we correct part of the line of here. <laughs> but I will tell you exactly what are we interested in galaxies, but goal number one, we are measuring galaxies, okay? Does this mean that Euclid is not taking pictures of the stars? Of course it will take pictures of the stars because it's taking pictures of 33% uh, of the sky and there are stars. Are we gonna use the stars for science? Definitely. But Euclid is a spacecraft built by ESA in the terms of being a survey mission which means that we are interested in the galaxies, but of course we are gonna be using stars, stars and some other objects that you can actually detect in these pictures to do science. So we actually need to take these 33% of the sky pictures to construct the structure of the universe. Uh, but I wouldn't go and spend millions of euros per ambition. In the past 20 years, cosmology has undergone a transition towards precision science. The standard cosmological model has been established, and its parameters are being measured with accuracy. So you see the standard cosmological model, three ingredients. Thank you could will improve this model's precision and help us unveil the dark universe by studying the large-scale distribution of galaxies and cosmic structures. At 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, we witnessed the stars in the Milky Way, our galaxy observed by Gaia. See, so Gaia is the one mistaken. Euclid will impose highly stringent constraints on the cosmological model that governs our universe. I will tell you more about the, the instruments in a bit, but you can Euclid will generate images in the visible and infrared, covering so one third meters, of the sky. Blah, 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 blah. And then we classify them. We have we created the largest the and most comprehensive virtual cosmic instruments that can be seen. Because this is what we need. We have created the largest and most comprehensive virtual galaxy catalog to date. We're going to fly through our simulated universe. That's the key. This is the simulated dark matter distribution. We note it is not randomly distributed, but rather forms clusters, filaments, and voids in between. To be sure that the science that we are Galaxies are traces of the dark matter distribution. In this visualization, they are shown with fake colors depending on some of their properties. Note how different types of galaxies trace the underlying dark matter distribution. This is a time there are different types of galaxies. galaxies. They can be red, green, blue. So you go Euclid's flagship simulation backwards. allows us to visualize backwards. the universe from different points of view, giving us a better understanding of the evolution of the formation of structure in our universe you over time. We have reached the limit of our simulation. However, this does not imply that these galaxies do not exist. Euclid will explore even further than our simulated universe. Euclid's flagship simulation brings the dark universe to life, blending observations with our best theoretical model of the dark universe. So as you can see, simulations played a really significant role um, for the Euclid challenges ahead. 
Without simulations, we would basically, as I said, we would be blind to test the accuracy of what we are doing with Euclid. So during many years, the Euclid science scientists have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to build the most scientifically precise simulations of what Euclid will be able to measure. And this is what we are doing right now. Right now, Euclid is already taking pictures. I will tell you more at the end of my presentation, but we were already comparing with the simulations. So for such a big challenge, which is taking pictures of billions of galaxies, you need to have like an amazing piece of engineering. And this is Euclid. Euclid was selected as part of the Cosmic Vision Program of the European Space Agency back in 2007 is when it was proposed. It was accepted, and then basically in 2011 was the moment that all the machinery started. We're in 2024. This already gives you like an idea of what are the same scales that we actually work with when we are doing cosmology and astronomy missions. But hopefully, Euclid was built. Uh, as I said, it's a pretty much rudimentary telescope. Uh, so telescope and payload module, the payload is where the instruments are stored. Uh, we're a subcontract to Airbus Space, uh, whereas the main contractor of the full spacecraft was Thales Alenia Space. So, telescope, the sand uh, shield that we actually need to provide electricity to the spacecraft, a cavity where two instruments are operating. I will tell you more about the instruments and the a service module that basically <coughs> takes care that all the engineering, electronics, communications, and so on are working properly. This is how Euclid in reality looks like. Yeah, maybe it doesn't offer you the same feeling that for me, but when I saw it for the very first time and the unique time that I had the opportunity to see it in person, it was beautiful. And I was really impacted by, well, first of all, that it existed because I was working for five years on something that I knew that it was real, but it's different when you see it with your own eyes, right? Uh, but what it is interesting to know from here is that when you see the telescope, the payload is here, and then, yeah, so the, the, sun, the sun panels. But in this other part of the spacecraft, right here, there is this little drawing that it was printed, 3D printed in metal, that is our near Euclid fingertip galaxy. This is really important. So basically, this is a piece of art that it was created by the scientist of behind Euclid. And it's a galaxy represented with the fingertip of all the different scientists. It was created back in 2019, and that was the first time that I joined the Euclid Consortium big meeting. I spent one week uh, thinking whether I should, I, I deserved to have my fingertip <laughs> included in the galaxy. Uh, so for the newer generations that are here, uh, the younger ones, don't doubt about these things, because uh, I remember that the, 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 the artist, so Lisa, the people that it was the artist behind this idea, saw me from five days, uh, like, are you willing to put your fingertip? And on Friday, right before the meeting ended, it was like, put your fingertip, and I'm really happy that I did. It was right around here. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know at that moment, I was like a four PhD student uh, starting, I saw the big people out there working in Euclid, making amazing contributions, so I thought like, maybe I will not continue working in Euclid, so why, why should my fingertips go to, to space? I did, I'm so happy that I did. So when I actually was in person seeing the spacecraft and I saw the, the drawing, it was like, oh my God, like so many things have passed, five years. So that was the Intelis Alenia space. The spacecraft was going basically revisions, the ultimate checks, and with ultimate checks, I mean, they took the spacecraft, they put it like in a really big complex, and they do whatever they want with the spacecraft. It's like if you take your, your, your mobile phone and you start shaking it, throwing it. I was suffering with my poor telescope. But this is to give you like an idea of how big it is. So this is a replica of one to four, uh, and 150, really small for this country. But I was really impressed, like, oh my god, it's huge. It's really huge. <laughs> oh, that's you. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's me, yeah. So, yeah, I've been, since I joined ESA, uh, a big part of my life beyond the science of Euclid has been communications. This is why I'm also here with you today. But many people have the opportunity to see the spacecraft before it was packed, put into a ship, and sent to the US to be launched. 
and it was like a really emotional moment for all of us. You will see later. <coughs> you clean in the payload has two instruments, as I said. One is called VIS, the Visible Imager CCDs. The same kind of cameras that you have in your phone, of course, a little bit better, but that is the same spirit, is one of the instruments of Euclid that it displays around here. The other instrument list is an near infrared spectrometer and photometer. Basically, what it means is that it's meant to be obtaining a spectra from the galaxies. A spectra measuring distances to galaxies. So coming back to your question, we measure galaxies, but what do we need these galaxies for? We take pictures, so we know the shape of the galaxies, and with the other instrument, we measure the distance to the galaxy. With the shape, which is a 2D picture plus the distance, we can construct this 3D map. And this is why Euclid has two instruments on board. Actually, the story of Euclid is that it was the merge of two proposals that happened in 2007 to the European Space Agency. There were like a group of scientists that wanted to send on a spacecraft only to measure distance of galaxies. There were another group of scientists that wanted to take pictures of galaxies. And as I said, okay, let's do a two times one. And they put two instruments on board. This was the joint of two missions, a space and Dune, and it turned to be UK. Some specifications about the instruments. So this, as I said, is a CCD camera, like a really powerful camera. Needs a spectrometer, photometer, used to measure distances to galaxies. And this is how they, usual, they actually look like. This is the payload. So this is introduced within Euclid, so you can see that the telescope is around here, so the light is coming through here. And then there is like all the electronics, so basically the pictures are taken here with this, and this is where it is used to measure the distances to galaxies, in the, producing the spectra of the different sources, luminous sources. This is a model, this is in reality the picture. So this picture was taken by Airbus before everything was packed, and it was sent back to Thales Alenia Space, this time in France, in Cannes, to make all the procedure testing before it was sent to the US. Uh, so here you can actually see this, the camera, and this is, this is NIST. The, as you can see, it is basically covered by so many things, especially NIST, because to produce the spectra of the different luminous sources, it needs to operate a really low temperature, okay? But remember, the sun is heating through here, that means that Euclid had to come up with a really powerful way of keeping all this payload to be gold. And this was a challenge on its own. Let's have a look more in, the, more in detail to the, camera, to the different instruments. So this is these, as I said, cameras. So six times C, so in total three, three, uh, 36 CCDs. And this is NIST. So basically, I'm yeah, visually, you could see that NIST it's kind of a camera, less number of detectors. In this case, it was four times four. But yeah, so basically, this is used to divert the light. And this is basically taking pictures. So we want to measure galaxies. We are interested in their shapes, their position and distances. This is why two, we have two instruments on board. Euclid is now in L2. Everything seems to be ready to start doing science. And what happened? in August, when all of you guys were on holidays, me included. We turned on the cameras, and voila, we saw that there was like a nasty piece of light at every time that we were turning the CCDs. This is what it happens. Imagine that you're taking pictures with your phone, and you want to point out to the sun, you will see that everything is white in your screen. Okay, so we want to take pictures of two billions of galaxies, and this is what it happens. We were crying. It was like, oh my god, this is the end of the mission. Uh, this kind of light uh, stating in the, in the detectors is an effect that we call, well, an effect is something that we call in our language light stray. It was a surprise, a really unpleasant surprise. This was coming from the fact that we have like some light that it was filtering from the sun reflected internally and going through the cavity of the detectors. In principle, this was modeled through simulations, and it was said that it wouldn't happen, but it did happen, and these things happen in science. You have to overcome challenges. How did we overcome the challenge? Well, this was a light that it was coming from the self-reflection, 
So we turned Euclid in such a way that this reflection wasn't happening anymore, which is what you're seeing here. So for some positions of the spacecraft, the light stray was really hot. However, when we turned it off a little bit, the light stray disappeared. And of course, this made some other implications, really bad implications. That is basically that the spacecraft, uh, yeah, we needed to redesign this survey of how to take 33% of the, the staff. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only unpleasant surprise. Um, we turned NISP and we turned BIS. And Euclid has to take uh, many pictures, like many, many pictures, which means that it has to be fantastic. It has to point, take the picture with a lot of precision and then change it back and take another picture, back, take another picture, take another picture. If you want to do that with your phone and you're moving like that, what well, does it happen? It gets moved, right? Like you have this straight and what is happening with the picture. Uh, so in order to prevent that, what Euclid does is that it has a really smart way of, the stars, we know them from Gaia, because Gaia has taken like a map of the stars. So I'm always pointing out to the stars, and when those stars are needed, I take the picture. And this is what Euclid was meant to be. But what we are seeing here is that basically Euclid was failing to understand where those stars so basically it was trying to make pictures, but it couldn't because it basically was getting confused with all the stars, so it couldn't focus. Uh, this problem was easier to be fixed because this was a problem of software. We have connection with Euclid every day, so it was a matter of doing an update of the telescope. Okay. Say it again, please. Like, it went to a rabbit for me. Ah, sorry. What, what, what happened? So basically, to be able to take really sharp pictures, uh -huh. Euclid, uh, what it does is it understands where those some stars, really famous yes. stars are, like Polaris, Vega. So it tries to focus on those stars, and when those stars are sharp, then it takes the picture of mm -hmm. the background. And it does that with, a, with artificial intelligence, actually. It does it with a software, but the software was failing. So it wasn't able to understand where those stars were. So every time I was trying to take the picture, it was getting confused. So imagine the faces of the engineers when these pictures were coming. But this was easily fixed because it just required like an update of the software. Ah, an update of the software. And as we connect to Euclid every day, you can make up you can make updates as in the same way that you make updates on your phone. Um, and it was fixed. Okay. But we are ready to make pictures of the universe. So this is a usual picture that you take from, it looks really bad, I mean, you will see. But this is a normal picture that you take of the deep <coughs> space with a telescope on the ground surface. Okay, so imagine a telescope in Chile or in the Canary Islands, and it wants to look like really deep, this is the best that it can do, okay? This is how you pick us. Let's do it again. <laughs> so <laughs> this is another example. This is another field. This is how we see with you. And still, we can do it better because, guys, this is just a snapshot of one of the 36 CCDs that we have for more. What you're seeing here is just one part of the detector. But we have six times six. And one of each is this. And what you were seeing was just one word. This is the amount of data that we have with you. And this is just one instrument, because we had another one we have missed. This was the first light of Euclid. This was the first pictures that we took with Euclid when we were able to overcome the issues that we had to launch. It's really important. So, with Euclid, we are aiming to do cosmology, but to bring to, to you guys, to the public, what we are really trying to do with Euclid, uh, we come up with an idea, which is we have a really powerful telescope. Seeing these kind of pictures, when you see the back and forth, the comparison with other observations, you get the wow effect. But we were looking for a better wow effect. Like we really wanted to show you guys how good Euclid could do. So we were thinking for months on the European Space Agency, 
which goals, which objects in the sky we could take pictures of. And then we say, we don't know it, let's ask the astronomy community. So we give the astronomy community the opportunity to tell us which pictures they wanted to take of the universe. It was an application, and everything that it was visible, it was photographed. And this is what we basically do. Like the big survey for cosmology purposes will go to Redshift 2.5, so three, uh, but we will be able to see galaxies that are farther away, probably Redshift 6, like she said. Um, people ask me, okay, but there were another telescopes in space. You have James Webb, you can have Hubble, and yeah, sure, you have James Webb and you have Hubble, not hate whatsoever, <laughs> but this is a comparison, okay? So this is how Hubble took the picture of the horse head, Nebula, with respect to Euclid. But what I really want you to see is this, okay? So Hubble is fantastic to zoom in in details, okay? So the field of view of Hubble was really deep and really reduced. So with one snapshot, this is what you get in Euclid versus what you get with Hubble, okay? So Hubble is great, James Webb is great to take fantastic details of what it is going here. But Euclid is able to take you really sharp pictures of the universe with a really broad field of view. Of course, if we wanted to take pictures of 33% of the sky with Hubble, it would take us centuries. This is why we are not doing this survey with Hubble of the James Webb. Well. Is there a difference in depth of field of photography? Yes, so James Webb right now is photographing objects which are way older, so redshift around 10, redshift around 12. So you will lose some capacity in there, but I still there is like a lot of universe between here and 10 billion years. So <laughs> I, I think that we're doing okay in that regard. Let's have a look at the Perseus cluster, my favorite. Why? Because this image represents more what we are looking forward to do with this lead. So let's zoom in to one part of the Perseus cluster that I'm really fond of. And what I really want to talk to you about is this part. So you see that there are like some galaxies that tend to be aligned. This is because we are seeing some gravitational effect in here. There are like a lot of data to analyze. There is no human power to go picture per picture. So we could compare like simulations directly with the data. We need to come up with some measurements that would allow us quickly to compare what Euclid is measuring with something about the nature of dark energy and that matter. And this is why Euclid will focus on two probes. One is called gravitational lensing. So what you are seeing here is basically the background of a swimming pool. And when you're looking through to the bottom of like a really piece of water, you see that the bottom is deformed. So you see here that the lines of the bottom of the swimming pool get distorted just because of the fact that you have light that it is coming through water. 
Something really similar happens in the universe just by the fact that there's like a lot of matter, 25% of 25% of matter that we cannot see. And that then 25% of matter that we cannot see, we can detect it indirectly by a really similar effect, which is gravitational lensing. The shape of the galaxies get distorted by the fact that you have mass between the light of those galaxies that are emitted towards us, the observer. This is what we are looking for, and this is why we need to measure the shape of billions of galaxies, because this is a really subtle effect. So in order to be able to say something about the matter that it is making the distortion of the shape of these galaxies, we really need to measure many, many, many galaxies. But this is not enough. We were taking pictures of galaxies for the shape and for, for what else? The distance, right? Why do we care about the distance to galaxies? Um, a question here. Yeah. If you look at one single distorted galaxy that looks uh, flattened by this gravitational effect, yeah. um, one could not distinguish it from just being tilted in this exactly. plane, right? So that you need an assumption that there is an isotropic orientation. Of the, the assumption to do the effect of cosmology, to study cosmology through weak lensing, is that we are not interested in the galaxies that it is kind of evident that the shape is being distorted. We want to do science with the galaxies that tend to align along some part. And the intrinsic assumption that we do is that if there were not matter, that it is distorting the light, uh, the shape of these galaxies, galaxies will be always randomly distributed. This is the assumption that we do. And this is why this is a purely a statistical exercise in cosmology. My husband is sitting out there, who is a real <coughs> statistician. And I fight every day because he complains how we do statistics in cosmology. <laughs> because the reality is that I do statistics every single day. So this is an exercise of cosmology, uh, this is an exercise of statistics. And with the other effect that I'm gonna introduce you is also just a statistics. So do you remember that we were taking pictures but also measuring distances to galaxies? It's because we know that galaxies are not randomly distributed. They are going to tend to cluster where more gravity is playing its role, where more matter is located. But now let me ask you something. Imagine that we are going to be abducted and we have like some aliens coming to visit us on Earth. And they say like, we are going to start colonizing the Earth step by step. And they look at the picture of how the Earth looked like during the night and they say, hey, if we want to get rid of human mankind, we need to conquer these parts because clearly it's where more people live. Mistake. It will be basically assuming that no humans live in Africa or in South, Africa, in South America or in most part of China, which is incorrect. So light is a biased tracer of where people live in the Earth's surface. And it's really similar to galaxies. The fact that you're seeing a galaxy means that there is matter there, but doesn't mean that all the matter in the universe is where we are observing a galaxy. And this is why we say that galaxies are also bias tracers of where matter is in the universe. So together with the effect of gravitational lensing, that it is distorting the shape of the galaxies, plus the fact that we know that when we observed a galaxy, might be matter there that we cannot see, but not all of the matter, we can actually say something about the underlying distribution of matter in the universe. So this is also one of the effects. So we know that, the, as I said, the galaxies are not placed randomly. We know how they should be distributed because we have a picture of the cosmic microwave background, the first light that it was emitted. So we can actually say something about the underlying distribution of matter. So let me just spend the last uh, yeah, six, seven minutes to tell you a little bit more about the scientists like me, that we are really excited about doing science and cosmology <coughs> with Euclid. So Euclid is a really global-led collaboration. So not only in terms of the scientists, but it involves more than 300 <coughs> institutions, 21 countries, many, many companies, a lot of industry contracts that always get returned to Europe. But let's focus on the scientists, more than 3,500. Well, these are all the people, including the engineers. But let's talk about the main partner that we have in Euclid. 
that is the UCLI consortium. So basically the collaboration that it has been in charge, or is in charge, not only to analyze the data, like me, and right at the end of the whole process, my job for the UCLI consortium is that once that the data is processed, and it is constructed, and it is clean, I will arrive, I will do shitty statistics according to my husband, and I will basically do cosmology. Okay, I will compare with the cosmology frameworks. This is what I do for the UCLI consortium. The UCLI consortium are more than 2,700 scientists registered, 14 European countries, plus the US, plus Canada, plus Japan. More recently, Hungary is gonna join us as well. And they are also responsible of providing these two instruments. So do you remember, we have two instruments on board. They were built by the UCLI consortium, and they were given to ESA to be placed in the telescope. And this is my favorite moment of the year. It happens once per year, but this is the where is Waldo moment. Okay, so once per year we all meet. Uh, well, not, not all. Uh, we usually are like 400, 500 people that meet during the meetings. So I'm, I'm really small, so I always tend to go to the front, so it's easy to identify. But this was in Helsinki 2019, where the fingertip galaxy was built. This was almost to Oslo 22. We were really, really, really happy uh, because it was the first time that we were meeting after the pandemics and it was like a boost of motivation uh, because we knew that this was a really tricky moment. We didn't know whether we would be launching soon because first we were launching with a Soyuz from Kourou, but they were in Ukraine took place. So it was a really dark moment for us in terms of a collaboration. But last year we were really, really happy because yeah, we met and we knew that we were launching, so the spirit was fantastic. We have already started taking pictures. And we started taking pictures of this 33% of the sky on the 14th of February. There was, it wasn't actually, I promised, I work for the ESA communications now, but I promised that it wasn't meant on purpose. It happened, naturally. <laughs> but it was a really nice moment, uh, so we took advantage, yeah, to be showing our love for what we would like to do. Um, if you want to keep posted of what is happening with Euclid, we are trying to keep the Twitter account really up to date. And as I said, Euclid takes a lot of pictures and it needs to be fast. So basically each night, take a snapshot that it is as big as the moon, but how does it do it? So basically it focused, it waits for some 70 minutes, like slightly more than one hour. It extracts all the light and basically it, sh it shoots the picture and it does this like every four minutes. Like, so four minutes, it waits, it distracts, and then it moves, and so on, and so on. So it's, it's, it's been busy. Like, it's been like really, really busy, because at the end of the day, it has to take pictures of a lot of parts of the sky. So basically, it goes and takes another picture, like imagine from here to here, it has passed like one hour and a half, one hour and a half, one hour and a half, and it is like that, non-stop, non-stop. And it's then the I'm big, seeing- Big Dipper. What? The Big Dipper. Yeah, then it goes, it goes deep because for each of these fields, it takes pictures of galaxies which are up to 10 billion years, like years. So it is a lot of work. And then people like me who are at the end of the whole process in pipeline and see how the data is growing and growing and growing. I say like, oh my God, I'm getting more and more and more work. But it's really exciting to see that we are, that we are almost there. Euclid is gonna take up to 30 petabytes of data, raw data. That means that it's not yet processed, okay? So imagine if you struggle to play online and you're not have like, I don't know, you have this lag on connection or you try to download something that it's few gigas. Imagine doing that from space with such amount of data. During a decade, ESA had to prepare to construct more antennas that needed to be updated so that we could contact Euclid and download the data. This is a challenge. And as I said, this is the raw data. Then for each field, you have to analyze, which means that you're building more and more <coughs> process data. And for that, you needed to construct data centers because otherwise, where are you gonna have like all this data? So we have nine data centers. The all around, all around the, but mostly in Europe, but also we have like uh, one data center from our partner, NASA. Um, we have one in the Netherlands, and each of these data centers controls one part of the processing of the data. So in the Netherlands, what we are doing is basically part of the spectra, so measuring distances, but also like checking these observations with other observations from the ground. 
I'm almost there, but I want to tell you like a grasp of what it is coming. So survey has started. So maybe you will hear from me, I don't know if I feel like reincarnated, like in two years from now, to tell you the first results, to see how we are actually doing. But Euclid is gonna take six years in total to take these pictures of 33% of the sky. So we have like a decade again ahead of us to analyze the data and hopefully to be back 10 years older to tell you what dark energy and dark matter is about. But how do we actually feel in the Euclid Consortium? Like how do the scientists feel in the Euclid Consortium? But we are gonna we are gonna check ourselves. Let's see. P minus 10. Anticipation. Tense. Trust. Nine. Fascinating. Expectancy. Yes. Eight. Unreal. Emotional. Frightened. Seven. Hopeful. Passion. Six. Thanks. Anxious. Five. Smashed. Mixed. Good numbers. Four. Pump. Impatience. Great. Emotional. Overwhelmed. Hope. Two. Three. Revolution. One. Amazing. Safe. Ignition. Excitement. Excited. Excitement. Safety. Excitement. Excited. So we definitely feel really excited. This is a mission that has been, we have been waiting for so long. I was waiting for five years, but there are people who have been waiting for 20 years. So we are definitely feeling super excited, super happy. And if you want to be tuned, just follow us on the social media. As I said, we are really trying to make every single little update that we have to Euclid to share it with the world. And also from the scientific community, we are trying to make our best to transfer you what we are doing in terms of science, okay? So we have, for instance, a blog, and we are trying to make educational videos in our YouTube channel, so for you to get to see what it is a day-to-day -day for the life of our scientists. So that is it. Uh, thank you so much for listening. very impressive how big Euclid is and how big the part it can be in science in the future. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, there's indeed time for questions, so if anyone has any questions, please let us know. Okay, um, I understood that the main focus of Euclid is to be able to tell something about dark matter, uh, but I wonder, um, I understand that by studying it, you will know something about the distribution of dark matter in the universe. But would you? What do you expect? Will you be able to know more about dark matter besides the distribution? Because you can see it, you can taste it, you can. So how? What do you expect? So for the case of dark matter, we aim to put some constraints in the nature of dark matter. So just by saying how it is distributed, you can already make some assumptions about their intrinsic nature. So assuming, for instance, that there is some exotic new particle that we don't know about, then we could put constraints on how this particle needs to be. If it is big, if it is small, if it is moving fast, if you won't be able to move fast. And all of those uh, features in their nature will have some implications on how it is distributed. So if we are able to say how the distribution is, we could do inverse reverse engineering. We can actually say, hey, particle physicists, look for a particle that have to fulfill these, 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 and these, because this is what we are seeing in observations. Okay. <coughs> so this is the goal. Uh, we won't be able to say, Euclid is not a dark matter detector in the sense that we are not gonna take a picture of the particle. But indirectly, we will be able to put like some constraints in the in in the nature of this possible exotic new particle that needs to conform. Right. And then uh, you can also help identify the dark energy. Yeah. Yeah. In what way? <laughs> like so. Let me see. access to this third dimension that it is the time. So basically how galaxies were distributed along the time of the evolution of the universe. 
we know that dark energy, or we believe that dark energy is the responsible of the acceleration of this expansion of the universe. How do we measure acceleration? How does the radars in the Dutch highways measure if we are actually going to 100 kilometers per hour during from six to seven <laughs> during the day? They basically measure um, yeah, a distance and how long did it take to actually go through that distance. So we will measure something like here. So we basically will be able to see how the expansion, so how the voids between galaxies have evolved along the time by basically making a snapshots of everything in different time periods. From here, we measure the acceleration of the universe and then we can compare to theoretical models that say, if dark energy behaves like this, this, and this, then the acceleration should be whatever. And then we go and compare. If dark energy instead is not a kind of energy, but it's just a mod that gravity behaves in a different way, we basically make the predictions with the theory and then we compare. But this is how we access to the measurement of the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. I think that you were first. Yeah. Um, I don't have a scientific question, but more a pragmatic question. <clears throat> um, it's such a huge project. So many people have brought so many countries. You showed the pictures of the instrument, and it looks quite, it's so fragile almost, or sensitive at least, and so many things can go wrong. It's now up there. But has there been like a spare nucleus? Has that been built in case something goes wrong? Because if something goes wrong, <laughs> All those people involved, all these countries, with 1.4 billion euros, you said? No. There is no spare part. There is no spare no. Like, this is why the day of the launch, it was our own in, as when yeah. we are playing poker. Yeah. Like, then, you know, we go all in. And basically, this is a jump of faith in some sense, because I have spent the last five years of my life working for this, but. Whatever, I'm still young, well, relatively. <laughs> I still like, have some room for changing my field of expertise and work on something different. But imagine those people that in 2007, they proposed a mission and they were waiting and waiting and waiting and then suddenly something goes wrong, it is it. Uh, this is something intrinsic to the nature of being scientists and also to the nature of being observational cosmologists. We need to, we deal with these jumps of faith every day. Like for instance, right now we know that we are operating from L2. We kind of believe that we understand how the physics of the sun is behaving. But what happens if the sun suddenly starts becoming like really violent? And this basically destroys the sensitivity of our instrument. It is what it is. So you have to learn to live with uncertainty. Like every day you wake up and you say, okay, so today I have data to analyze and this is my job. And <coughs> you know that there are like really brilliant people out there who are doing the best for operating the instruments, but it can go wrong in so many steps of the pipeline. Because what if when all the data is taken, I fail to actually understand how to make the comparison of the cosmological models with the data? I'm failing like, 2,000 of all the scientists and engineers that were out there working tireless to give me the data, right? So this is the challenge of being working on a really big collaboration, and it's also the first time that we are working with such a large number of people. So itself, I always say that you think it's a fantastic sociological experiment <laughs> to understand what it is going on in the nature of scientists, and especially astronomers and physicists. There was another question here. Well, you can be able to shed some light on the Hubble parameter. Yes, so exactly by the same thing. So the Hubble parameter, this is one of the motivations why we are also want to go to a space. Uh, because we go to a space, we could be doing the same thing from the ground surface. We go to a space because we know that in the ground surface we have the atmosphere that allow us, it doesn't allow us to have like these really sharp images of the, of the deep universe. Um, but by taking the best measurements and by measuring the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, this is what the Hubble parameter tells. Hubble parameter is itself a measurement of the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. So when I'm talking about measuring the expansion of the universe, I measure that. I mean measuring H naught, so the Hubble parameter. So right now we have a problem with the Hubble parameter. 
which is our measurement has become so, 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 so good that we are trying to say, hey, the Hubble parameter is 67 or 70 or 72, which with a really small error bar, with a really tiny fraction of uncertainty associated to our measurement. This is a problem, because if you're measuring 67 plus minus 0 0.1, and you're measuring, in another case, 72 plus minus 0 0.1, there is no possibility that these two measurements agree with each other. And this is coming from the fact that we have two different measurements. One, if we look at the really deep early universe, and once when we measure the Hubble constant around the neighborhood. So with Euclid, as we are gonna have access to 10 billion light years of history of our universe, hopefully this measurement will tell us something, or will even give us an indication of where to look for a more complete theory of black energy and modified gravity? I have work to do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Uh, if I understood it correctly, uh, Euclid's data will be compared to simulations that you've made. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was wondering, on what basis do you make those simulations if you know so little <laughs> if you know so little about the nature of dark matter. Well, we uh, so do you remember when I started putting this video? I was right here, I think. Yeah. So when we make the web app, sorry, when we make the simulations, uh, we make the simulations the assuming years, a cosmological model. Cosmology has undergone okay. a transition okay. towards precision science. The standard cosmological model yeah. has been established. So we assume and its parameters are being measured to make the simulations. So basically, the simulations that were uh, done so far. Euclid will improve this model's precision. So the simulations that were done so far were simulations where we assumed the best knowledge that we have of our universe, which was with the Planck mission, uh, with the Planck satellite, that tell us that the standard cosmological model yeah, has 70% of dark energy and 25% of dark matter, and this is what we assumed to drive the simulations. We assume that gravity works, and that we more or less understand gravity, and this is the results that we produce. If the results that we obtain from analyzing the data differ quite, ra quite radically, it will be a question of, did we mess up with the systematics on what we were processing the data? Or it's just that the actual universe looks way more different than the simulations that we had. So that will already be a quick way of telling us well, quick, relatively a straightforward way of telling us if the standard cosmological model holds or it doesn't hold okay. at the eyes of people. So does that mean that the standard cosmological model has makes some assumptions about what dark matter is? Because you said like it it's just, nature it can just affect the distribution. It assumes that it's some kind of matter that we don't know what it is, but it is matter in the sense that it interacts through gravitation. This is what we assumed. Okay, so. and and so there is a possibility that. If the results don't match up, that means that that nature is wrong. Or that the laws of gravity are not complete. That's yeah. another option, yeah. right? That what you're assuming that the uh, force is equal to the mass times acceleration is not the Newtonian limit of whatever relativity or like the gravity, gravity theory behind it, that there is something else. Yeah. Uh, so there is like a lot of room for theoretical physics. Does it mean for the astronomers who are here in the, in the, in the room you should go and do theoretical physics, no. Come to the amazing side of doing data cosmology, because it's a lot of work in the next decade, please. There was another question around here, yeah, and then I'll go back to you. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, dark matter is matter because it has a gravitational effect, uh, but you talked about the increased acceleration of the universe due to dark energy, which seems to be opposite forces. Um, so first of all, if there's so much dark matter, which should contract things, I suppose, and then we, we, st we still see that things are accelerating, expanding, then the force of dark energy must be really great. But how can you already say that these are two different things? Couldn't they be two phenomena of the same thing that we don't understand? This is, uh, this is one part of the, so this is one part of the, this is a really interesting point that already came up to the mind of many theoretical physicists saying like, sometimes you want to reduce the number of things that you don't understand. So tackling like five different problems that might have like five different origins, it's a lot of work. So you try to come up with something like this. Could it be that the fact that I'm seeing more matter 
but in reality, I could see with my naked eye. And the fact that the universe is accelerated have like some common interpretation. And what you will think of is gravity, okay? It's because I'm seeing like some parts of the universe have more gravitational collapse. So this is why I'm seeing like deviation in the shape of the galaxies or some other phenomenon. And I'm seeing that the expansion itself is accelerating, so that means that it's also related to gravity, like the forces around the galaxies and so on. So the common factor is gravity. Then your next step is, okay, so the theory of general relativity um, doesn't work at those scales. So we have tested the theory of general relativity in the neighborhood up to distances up to Saturn, because we still have Cassini or like other the Voyagers that gave us information and we were able to correct <coughs> the communications given the theory of general relativity. But beyond that, we haven't experimentally tested the theory of general relativity. So one possibility is, OK, let's look for an alternative modified gravity theory that gives us the possibility of like explaining two phenomena. And so far, we haven't succeeded in that regard. And then it's when you think of, OK, my substantially have a different origin. But those theories are still under the table. I mean, they're still on the table. So sometimes you, as a theoretical cosmologist, you have the theories that you can test now or in the next five years. The theories that you would like to test if you have the possibility to request ESA for money and create your own spacecraft, like it is happening now with UK. And the theories that you know that most likely you will never test in your life and not the future generations. So, of course, you have to put your resources on what you think that is more likely to happen and you have the possibility of testing. So with Euclid, actually, within the Euclid Consortium, I belong to the theory science working group. So you have to make these kind of decisions. You need to understand the data well to see this theory, yes, we can test it, this theory, no. Uh, is it disappointing? Sometimes it's likely, uh, but it's also a challenge on itself. So yes, some theories still gives you the possibility of explaining both phenomena at the same time. But the statistical uncertainty that we will have in putting constraints on those theories is still high. So even though with Euclid, we will need to come up with something different. You have a question. I think that was first. You were first. Oh, you? Okay. Who was first? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, do you, do you sort of have the Lagrangian point offers like the benefit of not being locked by the atmosphere and mm -hmm. other life and like that? Um, and then how the sheer amount of data that you get, like the 30 petabytes that you spoke of. But I was wondering how much of that data, despite you being in the Lagrangian point, is still noisy. Like how much denoising do you have to do? Oh, a lot. Data? A lot. Like my colleagues from the science, right? so the Euclid Consortium is divided mostly into the people. I hate this because everything is science, okay? But the UK consortium is divided between what we call the science ground segment, so the people that are doing these processing, so taking us from pictures to a catalog, where you have the positions of the millions of galaxies, the shape and the distances. And then you have the science working groups, where I basically work at, that will make the comparison. But all the cleaning is, is impressive. Like, when I was showing you these pictures, like from going to here to here, you see this, you see this, you see this, let me see here. This, 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 all of these are what we call cosmic rays. So basically particles that are being produced at the sun, and because we are close to the sun, they hit the detector and basically lift an uh, imprint. We don't do science with this. We could actually, this is, a uh, right now is the biggest cosmic ray detector that we have in space. So if somebody has, if somebody has an idea of how to do astroparticle physics with cosmic, uh, with cosmic rays, be my guest. But we are not interested in them. So you have to remove all of these. But in order to remove them, you need to take the raw data. Uh, in total, this is a question that I have for a really long time. What it would be the amount of data after 10 decades of work with all the process and cleaning? Because from here, you will have another image where you have removed the cosmic rays. Then you will have another image where you have remove the stars, because we are not interested in the stars. And then you will have like another 12, 13 uh, pictures where you are classifying like this mini, tiny little galaxy is a uh, one. 
this other galaxy, let me see, where do we have another galaxy that points out nice? Like, for instance, this one. This other galaxy will be a redshift, I don't know, too. So you will need to classify all the time. So it will be a lot of data. So, future time. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, other questions over here, but you will be downstairs yeah. uh, after chapters and coffee team cookies. So, if you have any questions, you can always uh, walk up to one of them and ask it. Yeah. Um, that's some practical. Oh, right. Before some practical points, we would really like to thank you for this talk. Thank and you. We're definitely going to follow through to ask you back in ten years. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank you for some gifts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Downstairs, you're very welcome to stay and uh, enjoy those. Uh, there's going to be a guest book on one of the tables, and we would love to hear some uh, things from you guys what you thought of the lecture, so you can write down your name and some thoughts of the lecture in the guest book. Um, some of you have gotten tickets for the tour. The tour will start at 4 o'clock, and you can uh, gather, assemble mm -hmm. at the main entrance. If you have not bought any tickets for the tour, but you still like to get, go to the tour, there are some tickets still available. You can get the tickets at the bar downstairs. <coughs> um, then, I have a little announcement. A little announcement. We would like to have a fifth special lecture after this report. Uh, and that lecture will be given by one of the committee members, Sean Beckers. He is a master student who would like to talk about the chaos theory. So there is not a lot of information yet, but once we have the information, we would send a mail, and we're very happy to welcome you there too. So more information about this will come later. Then our next lecture is on the 23rd of March, and there are still some tickets available. So if you'd like to go there, we have to be quick, and you can get them online on the website. Um, and there's also a donation button on the website. So if you want to give a donation, they're very welcome. And then lastly, uh, the guard will turn on the alarm at a certain point on the building again. So it's important that uh, the guests have left at 4.30. Um, so we're going to start sending people away around 4.20, just so you know. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Bob, for again.